welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day, not satisfied with throwing a little religion into our lives. That would be a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As this podcast series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Well, today we continue our extended series on Operation Alca and other events during Elizabeth's time in Ecuador. Today we're going to hear two Gateway to Joy programs, The Man from Montana, the Roger Udarian story, and Operation Alca. Now, Roger, that first story, he was a basketball player, a paratrooper, later worked with a tribe that used a rather gruesome, yet probably effective, visual aid to intimidate neighboring tribes. Later, we'll hear from both Elizabeth and Jim Elliott. That's right. We'll hear the voice of Jim Elliott and a message he gave on the resurrection, an excerpt from that. So stay tuned. First, though, let's hear the story of the man from Montana, that basketball player, paratrooper, and missionary. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about the man from Montana. I've told you the story of Jim Elliot, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Nate Saint. Now I want to tell you about a man from Montana by the name of Roger Udarian. Roger was working on a station in the eastern jungle of Ecuador called Makuma. The Indians there are well known as the Hiveros, notorious because of their method of shrinking human heads. For, I suppose, thousands of years, they have cut off the heads of their enemies and through a secret formula, have shrunk those heads to the size of an orange so that the features are still recognizable and the hair is still attached. These make very effective visual aids for their enemies. If they're stuck up on poles around the houses of the Hiveros or dangling by the hair from their belts, you can imagine that it would give an enemy pause, realizing that his head might one day be dangling in the same fashion. So Roger Udarian was working with the people who had once been thought of as very fierce indeed. Roger was not by any means the first missionary that had been there. There was a station that had been established in 1945 by a man named Frank Drown, and Roger was working with him. His wife, Barbara, was also there, and they had two children named Jerry and Beth. Raj was born in 1924 on a ranch in Montana. He was a pianist. He got polio when he was only nine years old. He went to high school in Lewiston, Montana, and actually had recovered sufficiently from polio to be a basketball player there. He got three scholarships when he graduated for Montana State College and was voted outstanding freshman of 1942. A year later, he enlisted in the Army and became a paratrooper. He survived the Rhine jump in 1944 and was decorated for action in the Battle of the Bulge. Through various ways, God eventually called Roger to missionary work. In 1945, he wrote from Berlin to his mother, I have a secret to tell you, Mother. In this, more than anything in the world... I want the action to precede the announcement. Ever since I accepted Christ as my personal Savior last fall and wanted to follow him and do the will of the Lord, I have felt the call to either missionary, social, or ministerial work after my release from the service. Can't say now what the calling will be, but I want to be a witness for him and live following him every second of my life. He went back to Montana in January of 1946 and decided that he was indefinitely to be a missionary, and so he enrolled in the College of Liberal Arts at Northwestern Schools in Minneapolis. And it was there that he met a quiet, fair-haired girl who was also studying Christian education with the idea of becoming a missionary. Her name 
was Barbara Orton from Lansing, Michigan. So Barbara and Raj were working there with the Hebrews on this station called Makuma. And Makuma was one of the stations that the pilot, Nate Saint, served with his little missionary aviation plane. The Hebrews had the habit of spitting through their second and third finger with a sort of a loud and explosive sound. And when Nate first met the Hebrews, he said all they do is laugh and spit. Another one of their seemingly peculiar customs was a 10-minute greeting. When men would greet each other, it would take them about 10 minutes to say, you've come, yes, I've come, I see you've come, and you live here, and where are you going, and on and on. I don't know what all they said that took them 10 minutes, but that was their custom. They would wake up early in the morning and drink a certain kind of drink made out of a jungle vine, and then they would make dreadful retching and vomiting noises and actually succeeded in emptying their stomachs. I don't know how they managed to do this by um, at will, but apparently that was a skill that the Hivero men had perfected, and this was their way of cleansing themselves at the beginning of the day. Their houses were about 30 feet long, made of split palm with thatched roofs and mud floors. There was a men's section at the front. Each child was taught the names of the enemies of his father and was made to repeat those names every day and to promise that he would avenge the blood. As Raj was working with the Hivaros, he knew that there was one group, also Hivaro Indians, who were called the Atshwaras, and they had never been reached by any missionary. His friend and colleague, Frank Drown, had made an attempt to reach the Atshwaras, and as he was approaching their territory with another missionary, he was met by a child with the message, turn around at once or be killed. Raj continued to pray for these people and that God would someday enable him to go and reach them. And so the time came when he felt it was God's time for him to move into Wambimi, an old shell oil station in Achwara territory. The chief man there, I don't, I'm not sure that it's proper to call South American Indians chiefs. I don't really think that their tribes are organized in that way. But the man who sort of seemed to be the head honcho was a man named Santiago, who had a serious nose disease related to leprosy. And he heard that the missionaries had a remedy for this disease, and he sent word that Raj could come and help him. And so it was that Raj was able to enter that territory which had never been breached before by any missionary. The first thing that Nate wanted him to do was to build an airstrip, of course. It's one thing to drop things by parachute and by the bucket drop, but that's a temporary arrangement. And so Nate instructed Raj in building an airstrip. He had learned at Makuma what was required, and he went in there and began to build an airstrip. Until that airstrip was built, Nate used the bucket drop using a 1,500-foot telephone cable and circling the plane at 60 miles per hour. Finally, the word came that the landing strip was finished. Well, Nate was not at all convinced that it could possibly be finished yet. It takes a great deal of time to not only cut down the trees and cut all the underbrush from under it, but then pounding the soft jungle earth and waiting for it to dry out, since it has never really been dry before, underneath the umbrella of the jungle trees, can become a very prolonged process, especially in the eastern jungle of Ecuador, where the rainfall averages about 12 feet per year. So Raj worked and worked and sweated and had Indians working with him and felt that the time had come for a landing. He called in on the radio and told Nate 
that he needed penicillin and that Nate must come and bring the penicillin to him. Nate wrote a very long account of his flying over, circling around, examining the strip from the air, deciding that could not possibly make a landing, but realizing from Raj's radio messages that this was an emergency, he prayed and eventually was able to land the plane. He gives this description in in his own words. While I circled back, I shook my head and said to myself audibly, no, it's just no good. It's just impossible. Nevertheless, I figured I owed Raj a better look, so I came by low a time or two, and one time I was about to cut the engine and yell down to Raj and tell him, sorry, no soap. But I went on by, took another look at it. He had it nicely marked with bandage material. He had 50 yards on the lead end toward the big house marked off, and then he had a line with the word wheels on it. I knew I could touch down from where the wheels sign was. Down at the far end, he had marked off 250 yards. Well, I haven't got time to read you all of Nate's fascinating description of what was involved here, but he landed the plane. Raj came running up and said, Have you got any medicine? Yes, I answered. It's in here, and I tossed him the sack. I had it all bundled up, ready to throw out of the plane. There wasn't any, Hello, I'm glad to see you, or Dr. Livingston, I presume, sort of stuff. Raj was haggard. He had a week's beard, a dirty T-shirt ripped full of holes. He was really a pitiful sight, emaciated. He was at the bundle, tooth and nail, taking that stuff out. Then he started shouting at the top of his lungs, voice almost breaking, to the Indians down the strip, barking orders. I've never seen Raj behave quite like that. I know that he can snap at people when things are tight, but in this case I didn't know quite what to make of the whole situation. So I grabbed him kind of firmly by the arm and said, Slow down now, Raj. Slow down. We've got time. He looked up out of those eyes and said, We haven't got time. We haven't got time. So I didn't argue with him. He handed me two bottles of penicillin and said, Here, shake these. So I did. He was barking orders at the Indians, and I thought to myself, My goodness, how on earth can these people think he's a friend when he talks like that? First thing I knew, everyone and his brother were getting shots. And so the little airplane run by Nate Saint saved the lives of the Indians with the help of this intense missionary, Roger Udarian, the man from Montana. Remember that every experience in your life, if offered up to Jesus, can be your gateway to joy. That was the man from Montana, the Roger Udarian story. One of Elizabeth Elliot's themes in more than a decade of Gateway to Joy programs was the importance of dedication. That's something we saw in the lives of the five missionaries who gave their lives trying to reach the Alka or Waldani people. Among them, Roger Udarian that you just heard about. Well, let's hear more. This is about a minute long as Elizabeth talks about dedication. And let's look at what John says in 1 John 2 15. Never give your hearts to this world or to any of the things in it. A man cannot love the Father and love the world at the same time. For the whole world system, based as it is on men's primitive desires, their greedy ambitions, and the glamour of all that they think splendid, is not derived from the Father at all but from the world itself. The world and all its passionate desires will one day disappear, but the man who is following God's will is part of the permanent and cannot die. One of my favorite verses, one of the verses that I gave to the reporters who asked us why in the world five men would go into a savage tribe in Ecuador and get themselves killed. And my answer was, the world and all its passionate desires will one day disappear, but the man who is following God's will is part of the permanent. Thanks, Elizabeth. That comment from a series on alternatives to dating, which shows us that Elizabeth valued that subject of dedication. It permeated her view on the Christian life, not just for those living in the jungles of Ecuador, but us where we are today. Speaking of which, let's hear more about Operation Alka. Uh, 
After this Gateway to Joy program, we'll hear from Jim Elliott. Not just about Jim, but you'll hear the voice of Jim Elliott when he preached on the excitement of the gospel. After all, that led five men to give their lives in Operation Alka. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about Operation Alka. I've told you the stories of five men, Jim Elliot, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, Roger Udarian, and Nate Saint. These five men were missionaries in eastern Ecuador, all of them with plenty of work to do, but all of them concerned about a work which had never been done, the taking of the gospel to a people called Aucas, A-U-C-A, people about which very little was known except that they were Stone Age people. They killed strangers. They didn't wear any clothes. For years, people had been fearful of the Alcas, and missionaries had been praying that God would somehow open a door so that the gospel might be taken to them. Their territory covered about 12,000 square miles, so it was assumed that the Alcas were a very large tribe. Gonzalo Pizarro had explored their area in 1541. Jesuits had gone in there in the 1600s, but not very much had been learned about them, and no one else had gone in there from the outside, so far as we know, until the 19th century, when the demand for rubber sent people into there. In 1874, a Jesuit missionary went down the Cordurai River and established a station in what would now be called Alca Territory. It was his main job to protect the Indians from the white men, not the white men from the Indians. Then there was a colonist by the name of Sevilla, Senor Sevilla, a man of this century who lived on the edge of Alca Territory. Probably some of the rumors that came out about the Alcas came through Senor Sevilla. He said they were killers. He said they killed to protect their land, sometimes to rob. And at one time, he had left word with the Quichua Indians who lived closest to the Alca territory that if they ever found any Alca women, they should capture them and bring them to his hacienda. One day, there were three Alca girls, probably teenage girls, who appeared in Quichua territory, and they were captured and taken to Senor Sevilla's hacienda, and they became slaves there. One day, when Jim Elliot was traveling in the jungle, he visited Senor Sevilla's hacienda, learned that he had three Alca women working there, and he talked to one of those women. Her name was Dayuma. He found that Dayuma spoke Quichua very well by that time. She had been for a number of years on the hacienda, but she did still remember some of her own Alca language. Jim relayed the information of Dayuma's presence to Nate Saint, the pilot, and Nate relayed that to his sister Rachel, who was a missionary in Peru at the time with Wycliffe Bible translators. But it was her prayer that God would send her someday to a tribe that had never been reached by any other missionary. When she heard about the Alcas, she was convinced that that was her tribe, that God was going to send her there. One day in 1953, the entire station on which Jim and Ed and Pete had been working was completely wiped out by a flood. All five of the buildings went down the Amazon River. It was following that flood that Jim and Ed and Pete made a trip down the Bobonasa River trying to decide whether they should change the station from Shandia to another one. It was decided that a station needed to be opened in Puyupungu, where Atanasio, a very powerful Quechua man who had about 15 children and wanted a school, asked that a mission station be opened. This was sufficient to persuade Jim that it was time for him to marry me, 
We had been engaged at that point for nearly nine months. We had been in love for a good many more years. And so it was a tremendous relief to me when Jim said, I think it's time for us to get married so that we can go down and open up a station in Puyupungu. So it was in October of 1953 that he and I were married in the city of Quito. We went to Panama and Costa Rica for our honeymoon and then went immediately to Puyupungu, traveling from the little town of Puyo down the Puyo River to the mouth of the Puyo River where it empties into the Great Pastasa. We set up a tent there, that was our honeymoon cottage for five months, and Ed McCauley and Pete Fleming carried on the work in Shandia, working on the language and building a better airstrip. As Pete watched the McCulleys become oriented in the work, he began to think more specifically about his own future, and he thought about his fiancée, Olive Ainsley, a slim and beautiful girl with dark eyebrows in striking contrast to her lighter hair and her blue eyes, and they became engaged by mail while he was still in the jungle. With typical candor, this quiet, studious man, Pete, wondered if there might be any conflict between his coming marriage and his call to the Alka Indians. Last night, Nate and I talked a long time about the Alka problem, he wrote. Strangely enough, I do not feel my coming marriage will prohibit me from being eligible to help in efforts to reach them. I feel that if pushed to it, Olive would rather have me die after we had lived together than to indefinitely postpone our wedding on the possibility that something fatal might happen. Our life has become one, and I do not feel that God will separate us in our discernment of the will of God. In June 1954, Pete felt free to return to the United States to marry Olive. After he left, Jim and I moved back to Shandia with Ed and Mary Lou McCulley. Puyupungu having been established as an outstation, we arranged for future visitation and teaching sessions. Shandia, with a school, medical clinic, and small store, we considered our permanent base of operation. Well, as you can see, Pete was already thinking about being a missionary to the Alcas, as were Jim and Ed, if God should open a door. This was the great prayer. And one day, after the McCulleys had moved to another station closer to Alca territory, called Arahuno, he and Nate went on a survey trip over what was called Alca territory. This is what Nate wrote about that trip. We followed the Nushino east, but flying the north side this time, we were able to scan a six- or eight-mile swath. About 50 miles east of Ed's place, out over the middle of nowhere, we turned due north toward Coca on the Rio Napo. I'd been eyeing a blemish, barely discernible in the jungle, maybe five miles away. Ed couldn't make it out, but we decided to fly that way for just a couple of minutes, and if we didn't turn up something more concrete, we'd beat it for home. The blemish grew into a well-defined pockmark and then into a good-sized clearing covered with well-cleaned manioc. This was it. We'd been cruising very slowly, and our fuel consumption was getting low, but we could still hang around for 15 minutes without cutting into the reserve. So we hung around. All told, we must have seen about 15 clearings and a few houses. It was an exciting time, a time we'd waited for. Those clearings were Alka clearings. There was no question about it. You can imagine the excitement that Jim and I felt when Nate flew into our station shortly after and said, we've found the Alcas. We know where they are. How about if we start dropping gifts to them? It was Nate's great dream that the little airplane would be the secret to contacting a primitive tribe and perhaps by the dropping of gifts persuade those people that the foreigners were not hostile. He flew again over Alka territory on September 29, 1955, with Pete en route to a place called Villano, and he found Alka houses only 15 minutes flying from Ed McCulley's station in Shandia. Was it a coincidence, after so much fruitless searching, that twice in two weeks he would find Alka houses, inhabited Alka houses, houses, 
There had been a number of occasions earlier when Nate had flown over their territory and found abandoned houses, no smoke coming through the roofs, weeds growing around the yard, no plantations nearby, and no people. This time, there was smoke coming through the roofs, there were plantations, there were people, naked people. There was no question but what they were Alcas. And so Jim made the four-hour walk one day from our station in Shandia over to Senor Sevilla's hacienda. He sat down with Dayuma, the Alca girl, and his little notebook and got her to repeat some phrases for him such as, Come, come, we are your friends. We are not killers. We are not people eaters. We are the white men, your friends. And so he did the best he could to write down what Dayuma told him. And then the next time that he was going to fly with Nate Saint, the idea was that Nate would rig up a loudspeaker and Jim and Ed would take turns shouting these Alka phrases, what they hoped were Alka phrases. And so you can see that threads of the will of God being brought together in the lives of these five men from such different backgrounds— Jim from Portland, Oregon, Pete from Seattle, Washington, Ed McCulley from Milwaukee, Raj Udarian from Montana, and Nate Saint from Philadelphia. Five men engaged together in something which was a top secret operation called Operation Alka. Remember that every experience, if offered up to Jesus, can be your gateway to joy. That was the Gateway to Joy program known as Operation Alka. The two Gateway to Joy programs on today's podcast were originally aired in January of 1989. Well, now as promised, an excerpt from a sermon from Jim Elliott on the subject of the resurrection. This is only about a minute long. Jim and his friends were excited to reach the Alka people because they were excited about the gospel itself. Good to be here to be able to proclaim the message of God from this platform once again. It's gone out hundreds of times, and I hope that we haven't gotten over the thrill of it's going out because, after all, we're fulfilling a prophecy of Jesus Christ every time we preach the gospel. More than that, we ourselves become directly responsible to God every time it's heard. And I hope that we're like children still, rejoicing in the awe and wonder of the love of God and his power. I hope we haven't gotten over it like so many Christians seem to. For my own part, since I've been away from you, the Lord has been stirring me up as to just what the gospel is that should be preached, just exactly what twist a man should take when he stands in front of a 20th century audience and speaks to them, How much should he tell? What should he say? How far should he go? What should be his approach? How unfortunate. Christians are so dull. We are so unattached to the scriptures that we fail to see ourselves presented in them. But we operate as the body of Christ, a thing foretold by Christ. And how we are to act is a thing which was not only commanded, but in a sense, since it was commanded, prophesied by Christ and his apostles. The Voice of Jim Elliot. That was an excerpt from a message Jim preached on the resurrection. We plan to present more from Jim in his own words on future podcasts. But for now, we're at the end of another Elizabeth Elliott Gateway to Joy podcast. It's presented in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, next time we plan to hear about contact with Stone Age people and more about spiritual warfare. So join us then. Hey, and thanks for being a part of our podcast today. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you are loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms.